You can't outrun your emotional injuries or your emotional dysfunction. That's principle number one. You cannot outrun your emotional injuries and emotional dysfunction. No amount of unhealthy coping mechanisms, addictions, vices, busyness, work, avoidance, or success will cover up your emotional dysfunction forever. It may work for a temporary period of time, maybe maybe a decade, maybe two decades, maybe even like me, four decades. But for me, after four decades of being completely emotionally clueless, stuffing, avoiding, stewing, brooding, compounding, compiling, it finally reached a point where I could no longer keep the 800-pound gorilla in the emotional basement. I could no longer control it anymore. And it started hurting other people around me. And it will, it, so it will catch up sooner or later. Pain and bitterness that's not transformed will be transferred somewhere else in your life. What is going on, EQ gangsters? Hope this episode finds you in a great spot, or and or at least in a in a spot where you are growing and progressing. So, this episode is is sponsored by Filter It Through a Brain Cell dot com. Filter It Through a Brain Cell podcast talks about helping people learn how to spot logical fallacies and also teaching people to learn how to think, which is an absolute imperative (laughs) in today's society and culture. So for more details, check out Filter It Through a Brain Cell podcast. You can also visit filterthroughabraincell.com. Have you ever, in your emotional growth journey, journey, come across folks that are struggling on the old EQ struggle bus, that that are struggling to grow their emotional health or emotional intelligence or they're emotionally unhealthy. Here's that's one of the challenges of growing your emotional health and intelligence is as you're growing emotionally, you will start to become more aware of those around you who are not emotionally healthy and those that are emotionally healthy. Which dealing with an emotionally unhealthy or someone with low emotional intelligence can be very very challenging. That's what this episode is all about. And I've got a lot of experience. Well, let's say my family has. So I have too, you know, because there's been areas obviously of that Kathy, of my wife, has been very unhealthy. And so I have been on the receiving end of, of her uh, low EQ in certain areas of our marriage and relationship. And then she definitely has been on the receiving end of plenty of my emotional unhealthiness and low EQ. So this is coming from a a, a wealth of <laughs> experience of, of no joke, two decades worth of experience and stuff in this area. So now for those of y'all that are watching this on YouTube, I'm going to be looking down at my notes to make sure I hit everything. If you're on the podcast, obviously no sweat. Also, I want to thank you all for letting us be a part of your emotional growth journey. So, so thankful. Thank you for being a part of my emotional growth journey. As you know... I have not arrived. <laughs> I have not arrived in the area of my emotional intelligence and emotional health. I'm getting emotionally healthier. I have grown tremendously and I'm so thankful. I still have a lot to grow and work on. So please know I'm growing right alongside you. For those of you all that have wanted to elevate and step up your emotional fitness program by incorporating the podcast and or YouTube channel, EQ Gangster, into your fitness, your emotional fitness program, thank you. For those of you all that have even gone to the next step, and have joined our emotional uh, intelligence, the EQ Mafia, our, our community, our safe, supportive, encouraging, equipping, empowering community of people that are, that are all working on our emotional health and emotional intelligence. Thank you for joining the EQ Mafia. We really appreciate the support and the community because you and your emotional growth impacts our emotional growth as well. We're able to be the, the beneficiaries and recipients of your lessons that you're learning as well. So thank you. Thank you for those of y'all that have, that have done that. 
All right, a lot of points here. This may this is going to be a very, very meaty episode that you may want to pause and take notes. You may want to review along with episode 222. If you have not heard episode 222, which is 20 lessons on emotions to encourage and empower you, definitely recommend checking that episode out if you have not already listened to that episode. It's 13 minutes long, very quick listen, and also very, very meaty, a lot of stake that you'd want to take notes, uh, probably take notes on. Okay, so get ready, buckle in. This is going to be this is going to be a lot of stuff. So there's 13 lessons. There's actually a whole lot more, but 13 lessons up front here, and then I'll jump into story time. You can't outrun your emotional injuries or your emotional dysfunction. That's principle number one. You cannot outrun your emotional injuries and emotional dysfunction. No amount of unhealthy coping mechanisms, addictions, vices, busyness, work, avoidance, or success will cover up your emotional dysfunction forever. It may work for a temporary period of time, maybe maybe a decade, maybe two decades, maybe even like me, four decades. But for me, after four decades of being completely emotionally clueless, stuffing, avoiding, stewing, brooding, compounding, compiling, it finally reached a point where I could no longer keep the 800-pound gorilla in the emotional basement. I could no longer control it anymore. And it started hurting other people around me. And it will, it, so it will catch up sooner or later. Pain and bitterness that's not transformed will be transferred somewhere else in your life. Number two, you can't hide from our from your emotional injuries and your emotional dysfunction. So you can't outrun them. Point number one. Point number two, you can't hide from them. You can the whole concept, right? You can run, but you can't hide. It's like the Jonah principle in the Bible, right? Jonah, who tried to run from God, but God wouldn't stop pursuing him. So you can run, but you can't hide. Your emotional dysfunction will catch up somewhere, somehow, some way, some form, some shape. Number three, if you work on your stuff, your emotional stuff individually, then it will help your relationships uh, and in, up to and including your, your marriage. So that's another important point. If you work on your stuff individually, your emotional stuff individually, it will help all your relationships up to and including and maybe even especially your marriage. If you just work on your marriage and relationship stuff, this is point number four, without doing any individual emotional work, any relationship work that you do will most likely be temporary. Again, see points number one and two. Number five, you have to take 100% ownership of your emotional journey. You can't fix your spouse or your partner or your friend or your colleague, nor is it your responsibility to. Can you love them? Can you support them? Can you encourage them? 100%, but it is not your responsibility to fix them. So be careful if one of your strengths is responsibility and you're emotionally unhealthy, that strength of responsibility can actually become false responsibility and you can take on other people's burdens which are not meant for you to carry. We, we um, to just keep, keep that in mind, we need to take our own ownership and responsibility to fix and get our own healing and recovery. Number six, you will, you will get out of your emotional fitness program what you put into it. If you work out once a year, your results will be commensurate. You will get once a year results. If you work out once a day, your results will be commensurate. You will get once a day results. So you, you will get more results based on regular, consistent, frequent emotional fitness than if you just do this once a year. You'll get out of what you put into it. Number seven, give both yourself and, and your spouse partner, friend, colleague, coworker, depending on where this applies in your life, lots of grace and patience in this journey. You may be 25 years old. You've got 25 years of emotional dysfunction and emotional injuries. You may be 35. You may be 45. You may be 55. You may be 60 or 70. You've got potentially decades of emotional injuries that have not ever been addressed or healed. So give yourself lots of grace and patience. And also that friend, that family member, who else whoever else is, um, this applies to. Number eight, you've got two to three four to four decades of emotional injuries. Again, these are not going to change overnight. If you're 60 pounds overweight emotionally, 
that's not going to disappear overnight just because you went on a one mile walk or a one mile run or because you did jujitsu class that day it's it's going to take time so buckle in for this emotional for your emotional health journey number nine the beginning of the journey is the hardest just like actually working out the first three to six to twelve months was the hardest for me when i started jujitsu it's still challenging for me uh, with jujitsu but i'm much more prepared and equipped every time i roll with somebody because i've been doing it for four and a half years in jujitsu so the, the beginning is the hardest, so just keep that in mind. It will get better over time. As your emotional muscles get stronger, your emotional resilience, your emotional agility, as you start to get used to developing and applying the emotional tools that, uh, that I share, you will get more comfortable and better working in this space of your life that you are currently probably not used to or comfortable working in. Number 10, you may only make little teeny baby steps initially but as you continue to grow your emotional muscles you'll be getting more and more comfortable with your journey that's number 10 number 11 by working through your own emotional issues and injuries individually it will absolutely impact your relationships in a positive way number 12 will will there be will there still be some marriage or relationship issues that you'll still need to work through absolutely but you'll be able to do it from a much healthier perspective emotionally You'll be able to do it from a position of safety and strength and and more healing rather than a place of weakness, fear, abandonment, or pain. Number 13, one of the challenges with taking ownership and responsibility of growing your own EQ is becoming more aware of the emotional health and emotional intelligence of those around you or the lack thereof of those around you. So just again, be aware of that. Okay, so those are the 13 lessons. Again, there's a lot more through the story time here, but now we're hitting story time. And I'm trying to hustle because it's it's a lot and it's meaty. So my wife and I, uh, my wife had to live in a house with a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a Bruce Banner and an Incredible Hulk. The dynamic that I created was completely unpredictable, unstable, traumatic environment for my wife to live in. And initially for my daughter, thankfully, I started this emotional growth journey when she was about 10. So there's still a lot that she had to deal with also as a daughter. But thank God, again, at 10 is when I started to really get intentional at growing myself in this area. Imagine living with someone who was completely emotionally unpredictable. Have you ever been around somebody that is completely emotionally unpredictable? What's that like? What's that experience like? Imagine living with that person. That was what my wife had to deal with. How would that impact you? Not knowing when the explosion was going to happen, not knowing how long the explosion would last. Is he going to turn into the Hulk for three minutes, 15 minutes, two hours? How should I bring this up to him? How should I talk to Noble about this? What if I say the wrong thing? What if I look at him wrong? What if I ask the question the wrong way? When he does return to Bruce Banner from the Incredible Hulk, how long will he regress into his emotional cave this time will it be two days will it be four days will it be one week two weeks there have been two weeks i've been in an emotional cave because of my inability to process my emotions what impact did that have on my wife with a love language of quality time via communication her love language is quality time with the, the the dialect of communication so when i would ignore her for days and even weeks at a time because I had no way to identify, process, or manage my emotions. How do you think that impacted her? When I completely ignored her, you know, ignored her and and didn't talk to her for again hours, days, or weeks at a time. Imagine what what that would be the emotional impact. What emotional impact would that have? Have you ever had your spouse completely ignore your love languages for hours, days, or weeks at a time? How did that feel? What was that experience like? How did that impact you? So you've got a couple significant emotional events all wrapped up in this, right? So my emotional instability, which created its own ripple effects, which led to the next thing, me going into my emotional cave for days or weeks at a time, which again meant me completely neglecting my wife's love languages throughout that entire time. How did that impact my wife? It created some of the following dynamics. She became fearful, almost terrified walking on eggshells every single day, not knowing when I would instantly, out of nowhere, go from Bruce Banner to the Incredible Hulk. And and that transition was not 
15 seconds or 30 seconds like it is on in the in the movies it would be instantaneous i would go from zero to hulk in 0.3 seconds not not even realizing that i had made that transition that is how emotionally immature uh, uh clueless unaware i was this incredibly tense emotionally unstable environment i created impacted her ability and desire to emotionally connect with me shocking right no surprise at all it created a serious degree of trauma for her maybe even to a ptsd level it was traumatic y'all it was traumatic and again some of y'all maybe you've had parents like this maybe you've had a sibling like this maybe your spouse is like this due to her abandonment issues she was also deeply terrified that one day my Hulk mode would eventually lead me to leaving her, which was incredibly triggering for her deep abandonment wound that came from her childhood. Big, big, deep stuff there. And for a choleric personality, that's my wife, she's the type A, for those of y'all who are not familiar with a choleric personality, or if you're familiar with a disc model, it's the dominant personality, that, that type A personality which is my wife, she tremendously values a degree of control. Now, we all do to some degree, but especially the dominant choleric personalities value a degree of control for, for our mental and emotional health. Well, it created a huge sense of feeling completely out of control for her because she never knew when I would get triggered and go Hulk mode, which obviously in those moments she had zero control over. It also created a feeling of loneliness, deep loneliness, because of how emotionally connected or emotionally close, because, yeah, because how, how emotionally connected or emotionally close could she really get when she doesn't know if I'm going to be, you know, Dr. Jekyll or Hyde, if I'm going to be Bruce Banner or Incredible Hulk. You can't get emotionally close to somebody when you, you've got to protect yourself emotionally, walk around with one of those bomb suits on. That's emotionally what, what she had to do. So how 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 close did she could could she get emotionally? Could we get emotionally when she's walking around in this bomb suit because she doesn't know when I'm gonna when I'm gonna lose it? So how do you think all that impacted her ability to interact with the outside world, with her friends, her family, uh, some of her her colleagues, business partners, that kind of thing? So what's again the ripple effect of emotional dysfunction, y'all, is far reaching. She, she rarely wanted to interact with anyone outside the home. She never felt emotionally safe in the home. So again, when you're used to wearing a bomb suit all day, every day in the house, there's probably a really good chance you're not ever going to take that thing off. So she kept everybody really at arm's distance there. And again, I had a big role in that. Now, some of that is for another episode some of that is based on her abandonment issues, but some of that I absolutely contributed to. So how about a deep feeling of constant confusion, concern, and uncertainty? Man, she, you know, she could have been thinking, right, is this my fault? Did I do this to him? If you have, again, a false sense of responsibility or potentially a low emotional quotient, low emotional intelligence, you may think it's your responsibility or your fault. You know, Maybe it's your fault or it's your responsibility to fix the other person, your loved one, your family member, your colleague, your friend. You may own your partner's issues. You you love them, right? So like, oh well, man, it's I, I it's my responsibility. It's not. It is not your responsibility to fix them, right? What's what's wrong with what's wrong with him? What's Noble's problem, right? Is it me? What did I do? Why isn't he talking to me? Am I not lovable? That could impact your value, right? That's a whole another ball game. And now multiply the above dream relationship scenario that I just described there by decades. This is how, I mean, this is this was how I rolled for decades. What impact would that kind of emotional environment have on you? What would have had, a, you know, how would that have impacted you? How would that have impacted your children growing up in an environment like that? Trauma and traumatic is an understatement, right? So what did my wife do? What was her responsibility in all of my emotional dysfunction? What did she do good? What could she have done differently? Look at that yourself. If you know of someone like me, if you have someone like me in your life that is Bruce Banner, uh, 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 Incredible Hulk, whether, again, maybe that's your spouse. 
Maybe that is a, a, a parent. Maybe that's a friend. Maybe it's a coworker, a colleague. Maybe it's one of your commanders in the military, if you're military. Maybe it's a CEO. Maybe it's one of your executives. What's your role? What's your responsibility? How do you how do you deal with someone like that? So I've got some things I want to share with you all. So again, is it your responsibility to fix it? No, it's not. Even if it's your spouse, it is not your responsibility to fix. Everybody has to take ownership or responsibility themselves. We already talked about that. Now, here's the thing. Might you might you be contributing possibly in some way to them getting triggered? Pushing buttons here and there. Sure. Absolutely is could be a possibility. But again, you are not responsible for taking ownership and responsibility of their issues or of their uh, healing and recovery. Now, is it is it a, a good idea to maybe take a take a quick inventory? Okay, how am I possibly contributing? Absolutely, probably a very fine and appropriate question to ask, just to see where are some possible areas that you may be contributing or pushing buttons here and there. But again, is it your responsibility to fix them? No, it's it's all the stuff in your boundary lines and your property lines of your house of your personal house, so to speak, of your life. That's the only stuff that we are responsible for is the stuff that is in our uh, home property lines, property boundaries there. Which brings me to the next topic, right? So now here's the other thing too. They are not responsible for your healing, growth, recovery, and transformation. They are not responsible. It's your responsibility to work on your stuff. All right, so next topic is boundaries. This is what you can do, not only for your spouse, partner, friend, family member, coworker, but also for you. What boundaries can you create so that you can remain as emotionally healthy as possible while potentially having to interact with somebody who is very emotionally unhealthy? Do you still love them? Absolutely. Do you still value and respect them? Absolutely. So you can create and establish these boundaries from a position and place of love not from a position of, well, man, I hate you, or, you know, you're terrible, or you're this bad person. Deep down, does somebody want to be emotionally dysfunctional? Is it? No. And and, and here's the deal. We all have our emotional foundations coming from our childhoods. That's where every human being on the planet gets our emotional foundation from our childhoods. Guess what propagates emotional dysfunction? If I'm emotionally dysfunctional, if I speak English, guess what I'm going to teach to my kid? English. If I'm emotionally dysfunctional, guess what I'm going to teach to my kid? Emotional dysfunction. It's You can't teach emotional health modeling a lifestyle of emotional dysfunction. You can teach principles. You can teach intellect. You know, But, but in terms of modeling, a lot more of, of life is caught than taught. So, all right. So, come from a place of love. Do you need to establish and enforce your own boundaries so that you don't go off the rails yourself? 100%. So boundaries is an act of love for yourself, for the people in your life, for for your, you know, in my in my perspective, right? I I love Jesus. It is being a wise steward of the relationships that God has given me. I want to be a wise steward and boundaries is an amazing tool to properly steward those relationships. So, uh, so creating the list of boundaries is this next step here. So figuring out, so here's the, so create the list of boundaries that you think would be healthy and appropriate in the relationship that you're thinking about. The next step is figuring out what the consequences will be if and when the boundaries will be violated. Now, I'm not being negative, but if you have lived your life like me for four decades with no boundaries personally or professionally, guess what? You're going to fail at this and so are the people that you set up boundaries with. Not because out of intention or because you're terrible. It's because I have been doing something for four decades and to make a hairpin turn and all of a sudden now I have boundaries. Give yourself a lot of grace and patience. Okay, the third step is to mentally and emotionally prepare yourself for the following. Number one, you need to mentally and emotionally prepare yourself for communicating your newfound boundaries in a safe, non-threatening way when all parties are not in an emotionally charged state. 
if you need to, even write out your boundaries in advance so you don't go off the top of your head, maybe forget something, and also, even worse, possibly get triggered emotionally while attempting to communicate your boundaries. Not a good time to communicate boundaries when you're emotionally hijacked and you're emotionally triggered and you're in Hulk mode. Not the time to communicate boundaries. Number two, emotionally mentally prepare yourself for enforcing your boundaries when they get crossed. Not if, but when. This is going to be new for everybody. Since they'll be both, yeah, so I already said that, since they'll be new for all of us, for everybody. Write out the consequences of someone, what, what, what the consequences are for someone uh, if they violate, if and when they violate or cross your boundaries. This will bring clarity by writing it out, will bring clarity both to you and to those you're wanting to communicate this information to. Number three, mainly emotion prepare yourself for thinking through how you'll respond, possibly again, even coming up with a script for how you'll respond when you get pushback for your newfound boundaries. How will you respond? So there's a, this is a lot of thought and preparation that needs to go into this, but the more work that you do on the front end of boundaries, it, it's a lot easier. Not that it's easy, but it's easier than if you didn't do this prep work, emotional prep work, to communicate some of these new boundaries personally and or professionally in some cases. Whatever you do, both for your sake and the sake of the other parties, you must enforce your boundaries. Again, are you going to get it right every time? No. So give yourself grace as often as you can enforce. You've got to be mentally and emotionally ready to enforce your boundaries. Now, why? If you don't, it will only empower and embolden the other person or people to continue the unhealthy behavior and treatment that you may already be on the receiving end of. It's just going to empower them. Oh, see, they're, they're not good for their word. They didn't really mean those new little boundaries that they're trying to establish with me. I'm going to continue to push those boundaries and violate those boundaries because nothing is going to happen. right? Think of the, the child who, who has the parent who never enforces the discipline. Hey, little Johnny, if you don't stop, I'm going to put you in timeout or I'm going to spank you or whatever the thing is right? for the parent of that particular family and the, and the family never ever follows through. Well, guess what the kid does? Whatever the kid wants to do. So now that kid runs the house and you, we've all seen homes where the kids run the house. And inevitably that's, that's in many scenarios, that's, that's what has happened. The parents don't enforce the boundaries and then you get the, the, you know, you, you've get a, a very unstable, very emotionally unhealthy, toxic, unpredictable culture and environment, either at home or in the workplace. Now, it, be very careful about communicating your boundaries, again, if you're not emotionally prepared to enforce them. So do a lot of this work up front. It'll really help and increase your success in this whole boundaries process. Will you be perfect at this? No. Will they be perfect at this? Again, no. But um, here's why this is, I guess, kind of a hot topic for me. Far too often as a people pleaser addict for most of my life, my yes was not my yes. It wasn't my yes. I would say yes because I wanted to please somebody else to, to make them like me, validate me, affirm me, approve of me. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, my no always meant yes because, again, I never had the courage or emotional health to have or enforce any boundaries. I, again, I never as a, and here's the thing too, if you if you have any kind of people pleasing inside of you, boundaries is probably a challenge for you. So just just that's an FYI, PSA, public service announcement to just be aware of. If you're a people pleaser, there's a really good chance you struggle in the area of boundaries. So this is something to work on. Now in this journey, be curious, ask questions, not to nag, but to learn. Again, realize that whoever this other person is, right, your, your spouse, your partner, your friend, your family member, there's, there's a reason that they are behaving this way, whether they're aware of it or not. There's typically an emotional dysfunction, maybe sometimes chemically, but that's above my pay grade because, right, I'm not, disclaimer, right, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor, you know, I'm not a PhD, whatever, uh, but there's a reason that someone is acting a certain way Again, whether aware of it or not. So just 
again be curious and realize that they're that they have their own dysfunction that they're that they need to work on and own so not to nag but to learn be careful about tone and volume when you're communicating stay emotionally safe for both you and your family by not entering into these potentially emotional conversations already emotionally amped you want to go in as calm as you can journal before going into these conversations which will create some awareness some self-awareness and some mindfulness for you it'll also help to rub those emotional knots that you may be feeling go back to one of my episodes where i talked about emotional knots there okay uh, pay attention to your own emotions as you're going into these conversations and while you're in the conversations if you need to pause and ask for a five to ten minute break to go for a quick step outside cool down go for a walk do some push-ups do some jumping jacks do it and uh, or or maybe you'll need to make that recommendation or suggestion or boundary for the other person or party that if they start getting amped hey hey frank bob susie francis can we let's take a five minute break let's just all get calmed down right why because if your tone elevates or their tone elevates it might be really helpful to take a five minute break or 10 minute break or come back the next day or whatever because you don't want to enter into a conversation like say for example this would be something that my wife would say i won't i don't want to enter in a conversation with you as you start to ramp up noble because i know that if you go to a tan or full hulk mode i no longer feel safe and i don't ever want to get in that arena and i'm not confident in your ability to manage your emotions once your emotions start to ramp up so as soon as you start to ramp up or i start to ramp up let's make that a rule of engagement or a standard operating procedure that we both just okay let's take a five minute break real quick take a walk around the house walk around the block and then we'll come back and re-engage if we feel like we've come back down to a to a comfortable spot encourage that other person to take ownership or responsibility to begin their own emotional healing journey let them know that you're growing yourself seek to help help encourage them to seek the help that they need to change whether it's their own personal work or even professional help if it needs if need be if they need professional help encourage that Encourage them to create their own boundaries for their own behavior. Again, if you don't deal with your emotional issues, your friends, family, and colleagues will be forced to. Emotionally healthy people help heal other people emotionally. Emotionally healthy leaders create emotionally healthy families, organizations, and cultures, which lead to optimal outcomes and results. So if you found value in this, please rate, review, subscribe, share, Thank you so much again for letting us be a part of your journey. Thank you for sharing your own growth stories and success stories in the area of your own emotional health and emotional intelligence. Thank you for letting uh, uh, us again be a part of your journey and vice versa, you guys being a part of my journey as well.